You've been here before. In the middle of a great game with good friends, and it's your turn, and you want to do X. The thing about X is it's your best move, but there's a catch. If you do X and the next player, well, if she does Y, then X won't achieve what you want at all. But you don't know what she's gonna do. And more importantly, you don't know if she knows what you wanna do next. But you have a guess. So you make your move and do Z. At that moment, wherever you are, you're here with us in Decision Space. Welcome to Decision Space, a podcast about primarily board games, but more specifically, it's a place where we think about the decisions in games. I'm your host, Jake Friedman, and I am joined today uh, by my co-host, Brendan Hansen. Brendan is an incredible game designer and also a a wonderful esports commentator, and and I'm sure uh, many other things as well. So, uh, Brendan, do you want to take a second to introduce yourself to our humble audience? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me here today, Jake. I'm really excited uh, to be on this episode of Decision Space with you. Uh, Like you said, game designer. So I have two games forthcoming, Ramen Ramen and Enchanted Plumes. They're both card games. Uh, I've been involved in sort of competitive games my whole life and just really love thinking about, talking about, uh, and making games. Awesome. Well, I am thrilled to have you joining for this very first episode. yeah, I mean, I'm excited just to kind of dive into a whole new project here, and we'll see uh, if anything comes of this and, and where we go from here. But I feel confident that we'll get off to a great start, and I'm taking some comfort knowing that I've got you in the studio uh, here with me. So thanks again for being here. Yeah, same. Likewise, your your deft hand uh, running podcasts and conceptualizing podcasts is super appreciated. I feel like I'm in the the passenger seat of a car on the way to a destination that's like totally set and wonderful. So I'm excited to dive into this game too. That's funny because I thought we were, you were going to say we'll figure it out on the way where we're <laughs> going because that's that's where I'm at right now. Um, but but anyway, yeah. So just because this is the very first episode, the concept for this show. I know there are tons of wonderful board game content out there and, you know, tens, uh, if not hundreds of podcasts specifically about board games. And what I think uh, might make this show different and interesting is that uh, we're going to really dig deep in each episode into just one game and look at the decisions that you come across when playing that game. And, uh, you know, both the strategic and tactical elements that come into it, but also the subjective experience of of what it feels like to be in that seat playing that game and and what you're thinking about and experiencing as you're making those decisions. Yeah. And I think that's really the the perfect lens. When you first told me about that, Jake, to to tackle game design, Sid Meier has this really interesting uh, quote that's been ascribed to him for a long time, that games are a series of interesting decisions. And I think games, the definitions of games are are tough to define, uh, but it's a really good place to start. And I think this will be a really trusty lens for us tackling these games. The game we're going to be talking about in this episode is Kanagawa. And before we get into the breakdown of the game and start talking through the decisions, Brendan, what is your rating for Kanagawa out of 10? And did you come up with a slogan for the game? Yeah, so my rating for this game out of 10, I actually I I adore Kanagawa. I think it's an incredible game for a lot of reasons. Uh, The art being one of them and then just the gameplay. So my rating is nine and I did come up with a funny slogan. Uh, So to brush... Or to bucket? That is the question. (laughs) All right. Well, we'll have to definitely get into what that means uh, in the discussion. Uh, So that's awesome. So you love this game. Uh, For me, I'm putting it at a 7.9 out of 10. And I really like the Board Game Geek scale. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm framing this as. So for me, that is just brushing up against greatness. Uh, but I'm, I'm keeping it as just a very good game. There's just a couple of things here and there that make it not a great game to me. But this is a, a very good game that I enjoy. And my slogan, not quite as quippy as yours, but it's just this is a hidden gem in plain sight. Nice. And, and uh, all right. So with that, 
You ready to jump into the game breakdown? Yeah, let's do it. That's uh, that's that's paint some murals. All right, so this is our first episode of Decision Space, and, and Kanagawa is not necessarily a huge game. Uh, so I'm curious, can you talk a little bit about why you chose this game uh, when I came, came to you with this concept? Yeah, absolutely. So you you sort of pitched this concept to me, and I the first game that jumped in my head was Kanagawa. And I think the reason for that is because the way in which decisions are structured in Kanagawa is really upfront and forceful. Uh, some games, I think, sort of, I, I don't know that they hide their decisions, but they they don't sit as uh, clearly or as blatantly on the structure of the game as, as others. And I think Kanagawa is so clearly uh, designed in a way where the decisions jump out at you. And there's a ton of thought in the way in which the game is designed, sort of asking you to make decisions constantly. Uh, so to me, it seemed like the perfect jumping off point because the designers, Bruno Cathala and Charles Chavayer, I, I hope I said his name, uh, Charles's name right there, uh, I think were really careful to give the player a ton of choices. And they just jump in at different moments in the game and say, what do you think about this choice? Or what do you think about this one? And gives the player a lot of agency uh, and decision space. Yeah, I think that is uh fantastic and that really hits the nail on the head when yeah and when you suggest that it's funny because um and this kind of goes into my slogan but kanagawa is a game that i already had in my collection and already adored uh and it's probably the game that i've i've recommended to people Mm. most in the context of like what's a game that doesn't get enough love or or what's a game uh, that you don't think enough people know about. And Kanagawa is always one that comes to mind for that. So I've offered this as a recommendation to a bunch of folks. So for that reason, it seems kind of fitting too, uh, to dive into a bit deeper. And then like you, right, I feel like the decisions are frequent and they're also very distinct, uh, which makes it a, I think, an ideal trial run to see if this uh, concept does indeed bear fruit and if we can get into... Uh, some interesting territory as as we think through those decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And I I also think that in a lot of ways, the game itself is very inviting and sort of anyone can pick up and play it. Like you mentioned, it's one I'm quick to recommend to others too. It's one I've played with my family a lot. Uh, so I think in in hopes of sort of finding our, our podcast uh, footing, it's a good one because it's literally a game that I think would appeal to almost any any gamer. I agree, and let's help our audience find their footing by rolling the game overview. Kanagawa invites players to step into a workshop, pick up a paintbrush, and to craft beautiful painted panoramas featuring their favorite subjects. Each turn has two discrete steps, the draft in which players acquire new knowledge and working in your studio, where you either take that knowledge and broaden your resources, or put it to practice adding to your painting. During the draft, cards depicting trees, animals, people, and buildings are dealt to columns. Some of these cards are face up, and some of them are face down. And players take turns choosing a column of cards to take. Sometimes players will opt to take cards early, receiving fewer cards per round to guarantee they get the cards they need. But at most, players will receive three cards per round. After taking those cards, players must choose how they're going to utilize their cards as a resource to paint future paintings or if they can afford the paint cost of a card as part of the painting itself. As players complete different aspects of their painting, they may decide to claim a diploma, victory points, for the end of the game tied to an aspect of their painting's subjects or their resources. These diplomas come in multiple tiers for each aspect, and when players meet the criteria of a diploma, they must decide if they'll take it immediately or forego that specific diploma forever, instead opting to try to complete a more difficult diploma, knowing they'll never be able to claim the easier one again. A game of Kanagawa ends when a single player has completed their beautiful tableau by adding 11 cards to it that ends it for everyone. Also, players are competing for victory points on a few other vectors as well. But that should give you a gist of the game and how Kanagawa plays.
Thank you for that wonderful game overview. Now let's get right into the conversation about the decisions in Kanagawa, and we'll start with the first one, which is the draft, which we'll also refer to as the offer in this conversation. So Brendan, I'll I'll throw to you first. What are you thinking about when you're deciding what painting cards to take? Oh, goodness. So at the, at the, <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, one thing I love about Kanagawa is what you're thinking at this point in the game can vary really dramatically at different points in the game, right? Like at the outset, I'm really looking at my starting tile. Uh, every Everyone starts with a starting tile and you have a season on it. So I, I want to make sure I match that season. Uh, and then I'm also just thinking like, what are the most efficient tiles out here? Are, are there any like, are there tons of trees on in one of these columns? Am I doubling up on any sort of resources? Um, I'm also looking at other players' boards somewhat. I'll, I'll do that a little bit more in two and maybe three player games. Uh, in a four player game, it gets a little bit harder to sort of deny people what you're looking for. Um, But one thing I think when we were playing this, Jake, that's also so interesting is making the decision to take early with the round mechanic of the the tiles being added as you go. And if you really want something, being willing to sacrifice just taking one tile or just taking two. Yeah, I think that is a huge decision point in the game, because if you take two tiles, right, and you're giving the other person three, you're giving up like an enormous amount of efficiency, right? That's 30, they're able to do 33% more than you during that turn, which is a lot. So, you know, if you're doing that, it better be worth it to you, you know, and really valuable. Um, so I think that that's tough. And I find it like, it's it's very rare, especially in a two player game that it would be worth it. I mean, I think in our games, really only once or twice per game did that come up. And I think sometimes when I had done it early in, in that one or two times, I regretted it at the end of the game. And I was I, I even thought, you know, that might have been kind of the the pivotal moment where where I lost one or two points. One other thing that we should mention is at the end of the game, every card in your landscape in your painting is worth a point. Um, So not every card that you draft is going to end up being a point in Kanagawa that you get because you could end up just having to play them as uh, resources to your studio. But I think having that that framework of maybe like every card is worth a third of a point or half of a point sort of puts that into perspective a little bit potentially for players and going early is is definitely detrimental uh in a two-player game when you know for sure everyone else is going to go to three all the way yeah one thing that makes this the decision so interesting too is it has a tendency to shift throughout the game Mm -hmm. like in the first turn right you're might you get you only have one type of the four different landscapes that you're able to paint with your starting tile. I find when I'm playing that I put like a high priority Mm -hmm. on taking a tile that I know I can add to my studio right away that first turn. By doing that, I am perhaps not maximizing what I could be adding to my studio for a long game, but getting that one card early on is a lot of times really valuable because it also can help inform the types of uh, diplomas that that you might be going for, right? Because at the beginning of the game, you're not going for any kind of diploma necessarily. It's a clean slate. Sure, totally. And and like you mentioned too, Jake, interestingly, at the outset, uh, it's impo- on your very first turn of the game, it's impossible to build, to paint two cards into your uh, painting because even though... Is that true? That is true because you only the maximum you'll get three cards uh, and the minimum that cards cost is one of a paint type. So you could never place two cards and paint two cards. So you're always just going to be able to paint one painting on that first round. I think uh, you can paint two. Cause can you paint two? Your, your starting tile has allows you to paint. Oh, one you're thing. so right. So you I'm could, sorry. Yes. No, you're good. But yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, being able to paint uh, two things in that first turn that be is a pretty big advantage theoretically, right? Because that that's working towards all these diplomas. Um, theoretically, not every single card you paint works towards a diploma, but uh, the majority do, right? The majority have some feature besides just being a blank landscape, whether that's a person, a house, an animal, a tree. 
Um, so you're already chipping away at those diplomas that can really put pressure on other other people to usurp what you're doing. Yeah. And I think the game, interestingly, I'm really glad that you clarified that. And so sorry about my brain fart on being able to build two at the outset. But the game sort of gives you the choice. Do you want to do you want to specialize or do you want to be a generalist in terms of that first diploma? Right. Uh, from the outset, are you going to race really hard for one thing and try to push to the top of it? Uh, maybe or spread wide, wide and keep your options open of what you're going for. And I, I really like that. Um, another thing about the offer slash tile selection design decision space that I think is really interesting, I alluded to it earlier, is just that the back of the cards are functional in Kanagawa. Uh, a lot of games, the back of every card is exactly the same, and they don't give you perfect information, the back card backs in Kanagawa. They just tell you that there's a chance that this type of thing will be on it. Uh, it could also just be a, a blank tile. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify. So like if it's a green back, you know that on the other side of that card yes. will either be a tree uh, or it'll be nothing. Right, exactly. And that just having that little bit of information can make players be willing to take risks on taking cards early that they might not otherwise. There are a few times in our game, Jake, uh, are the games that we played where the second... So in a two-player game, the second card that comes out uh, in column two will be obfuscated. So you won't be able to see what it is. You'll just see the card back. Uh, and one time specifically, the first one was an animal. I think it was uh, the deer animal that comes out. And the animals are interesting. Sort of all of the different card types ask you to set collect in different ways. And the animals are sort of uh, about making pairs or, or there's one where you make a set of three. Uh, and they interact in interesting ways. So I knew that there was some small chance, it was towards the end of the game, that if I took those two tiles, I would get just what I needed and I would get the deer and the boar for, for one of the diploma sets. And it was there was a slim chance that I could sort of throw a Hail Mary and get it. And I think that round I went for early and got it uh, and it was really advantageous. So that's just an interesting uh, potential way that you can that the designers made it such that you don't have perfect information, but you're not just picking blindly. It's not just a random card. Yeah, and I think it also, to add on to that, the choice to have some face-down card does something really interesting. It has an interesting effect on the subjective experience of playing because I think when I'm playing the game, just knowing that there's a face-down card that I can't get perfect information, no matter how much I try, really discourages me from trying and mm. looking at everybody's tableau and mathing out exactly how many trees everyone has, how many yeah. buildings everyone has, you know, cause that information's all there. You can look at it. And I think like obscuring some information is kind of signaling the players in some way, it's like chill. It's not really that kind of game. Totally. I think that that's one of the most generous game design decisions they could have made to the players, like you're saying. Uh, it, it just allows everyone to relax. And I think that there's also a lot of pressure in games that are perfect information draft games, right? Like everyone's board is completely open information. If all of the cards were also open information, that can be really paralyzing because there's this desire to want to analyze. And also you sort of feel judged for the decisions you're making. And just by hiding that little bit, it, it makes the decision space just cloudy enough that you can, you, I, I don't want to say you can rest on your laurels, but you don't feel the pressure that you might if it was completely open information. So that was like brilliant, brilliant little design decision from, of vet veteran designers that I think made the difference in this game. I think it would be a fundamentally worse game if it was all open information. Yeah, it like takes that objective right play almost off the table. Yeah. Because, yeah, so you don't have the pressure to strive for it. I think I'm reiterating what you're saying, but I, I agree. And then the, the kind of the last thing I wanted to say that I think is so interesting about uh, this portion of the game, which I think deciding when to take cards is often a little bit of a false choice because you know in a two-player game like at what we found is it is almost always wrong there could mm. be niche scenarios for sure when you want to take two cards because they're you know exactly two cards you need or it's preventing your opponent from taking uh completing a, a really valuable diploma like those things are out there and are probably going to come up one or two or three times a game but but not much. 
I don't know if pick, taking one card would ever be correct oh. in a two player game, right? Taking just giving away 66% of your efficiency. Yeah, the only thing that I could think of is if the two of you were really racing and you'd both passed on the first two diplomas of a type, maybe of the trees, let's say. Um, so you've both already passed and you've both for some reason committed. It's really unlikely that you would ever end up in a situation like that where you're trying to race each other. Um, but that's the only thing that I could think of, right? Where you're taking the first card that comes out to take a round three diploma, denying it of your opponent. I just don't think it's a likely game state to end right. up in. Yeah, I, I think you're right, though. That is definitely a scenario where, you know, it could be a 10 point swing. And sure. we should say scores in this are, you know, high 20s, low 30s are pretty good scores. So a 10 point swing would be pretty massive in, in a two player game. So I think you're right. But the awesome part about this is choosing your column, right? Yeah. Because you're that's where you get that really fun. To me, this is the fun decision, the most fun decision of the game, because you're able to, without pressure, right? There's not the objective, uh, correct or, or wrong thing. That's not really there. You know, you can certainly. That doesn't mean you can't make good and bad decisions. Uh, you can absolutely. Uh, and there's a lot to think about. And what's really fun is just briefly looking at all the players building and say, okay, she's going for trees. He's going for buildings. You know, I'm going for this. Uh, and, and just letting that kind of wash over your brain, like taking in and then saying, you know, making the heuristic choice, like this is the column I want. And I think that's for me where I find the most enjoyment playing this game. And when you take something that somebody else wants, Man, it can be fireworks because, you know, that can feel pretty cutthroat and mean. But also, like, you know, if you're you realize in that moment, you're like, yes, they were going for trees. You know, that was what they were going to do. So not only do I get what I want, but I'm taking it off the table for them feels really satisfying. And in a, in a way that almost feels bigger and juicier than what is ultimately a really light, quick playing game. Yeah, we talked about this too while we were playing, Jake. And I think that the, the draft especially is such a fun moment every single time it happens because you get this rush of new decisions that you get to make. You get all of these cards. Every card comes with at least two uh, a binary decision built in. Am I going to put this in my studio? Am I going to paint it? Uh, and then there's cascading decisions that come from that. So it just, it, it chokes the game for a minute. It slows things down while everyone sort of goes around. It's quiet, you're thinking. And then there's this like rush of activity. Sometimes you get to flip a card over which is this other burst of excitement um so it i love the pacing that the draft gives the game all right so do you have any final thoughts on that or should we move on we should definitely move on but one quick point i want to make is the the wilds we didn't talk about how there's a few cards in the game where the resources on them are potentially every resource in the game uh they also come with the penalty of two negative points and those can be really powerful. Yeah. So let's clarify. When you're saying they're wild, you're talking about when you're placing them into your studio, they allow you to paint any type of landscape. Yes, exactly. So one of those really early, it, it comes with uh, negative two points at the end of the game and player with the most points wins. We didn't clarify that, but hopefully that's clear. Um and those can be incredibly power, powerful early. And then late game, just a huge detriment. You don't need them. You have all the resources that you need. So that's one of the ways in which the decisions really can shift through the course of the game in addition to the diplomas, which can change the value of different cards wildly for different players. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just knowing when to pivot, right? It's like yep. a skillful moment that comes up. We're like, okay, I was going for trees. But look, I can get all of these other things, and now I'm gonna make that choice to to shift my strategy. And and yeah, I think we should say like too about you know when we think about decisions, there's I guess kind of a the di dichotomy between strategy and tactics, right? Where strategies are kind of your your bigger overarching plans, and, and tactics are are sort of doing things efficiently within that. And and to the extent that there's strategy in this game. Uh, I, I, I'm interested if you agree with this, but it comes out in that drafting phase because that's when you're kind of really picking like, okay, what are the diploma tiles that I'm going for? Yeah, definitely. I, I very much agree with that. The, the strategy is completely born in the decision 
of the draft. That's where you're you're choosing what direction you're going to go overarchingly, and then you get tons of tactical decisions after that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's perfect. So yeah. yeah, so that that's another thing that makes that so fun, and and I think we spent a lot of time on that decision because it is such a big important decision that literally informs everything else that comes after it. Uh, so uh, you know, to me, that's kind of like the the biggest decision space, and then we narrow in from that. So the next thing you do after taking those tiles, um, you know, you've picked your column, you've gotten one, two, hopefully not one, but two or ideally three new cards. And you have to choose whether you're going to paint them and, and add them to your panorama of p- lessons that you've painted, or if you're going to flip them over and add them to your studio to enhance your studio's capabilities in some kind of way. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into deciding where you're going to place your cards. Yeah, so early game, I think the decision is a lot about laying out your engine, right? Putting all of the cards, I guess it's not really an engine, it's not an engine building game, but laying out your your paints so you can have a breadth of resources to allow you to be flexible in what you're painting into your, into your tableau. Uh, so for me, the decision early on is really about what resources I want down below. I'm not thinking about what I'm painting up top quite as much. I am a little bit. Uh, There's times where I'll go into that, but really early on, I care about the resources that I'm drafting a little bit more, I think. Um, And then in addition to that, I want to mention really quickly, another thing that can play into this decision is there's an active player piece being moved around the table. Uh, which can be really important. And that always also gives you a point too. So it's sort of deciding when it might be worth it to sacrifice painting something into your landscape to tuck one of those cards into your studio and take that piece. That's really interesting that you say that you think more about the uh, what you're adding to your studio, making sure you have a wide breadth of paints early on. And because I frankly, like when we played that game, whenever I played this game, my first priority is is getting cards into my painting up top you know that's primarily the way you get the most valuable diploma cards uh so when i see you know something that's really valuable like a, a, a card that has three trees on it i'm just thinking like how can i get this into my painting by any means possible and I should say when we played twice, you won both times. So I'm not necessarily advocating uh, that is the the best plan, but I've also had a lot of success with that. I think it's certainly viable to kind of rush the end of the game and, you know, adding as many cards as you can early and often to get diplomas. And that'll also bring about the end of the game, uh, which we should mention occurs once somebody's painted their 11th card. And those games are super close. So I think there's tons of room to, to rush in the game or to play a little bit more slowly. I think part of the reason why I like to focus on resources, painting resources early on is just because it keeps me open. And I can also, I will say I probably as a player overvalue creating those long strings of seasons. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that every card has sort of the trees or the animals or the houses or the people on it, uh, but it also has a season and you get points for the longest run of the same season. And I think that there's probably a little bit of weakness in that strategy that I mentioned, uh, just because if players key into sort of hate drafting that away from me after it gets a little bit too long, I think it could be a fragile strategy. Um, But regardless, I like being able to stay open, know that I can bank some points that way and then sort of see what comes my way and then play into it later on. So I guess strategically it leaves me open. Yeah, right. definitely. And and I have also seen people really paint themselves into a corner uh, by not giving themselves access to different types of paint. So just yeah. to be clear, again, every time you're adding something to up top to your panorama, you know, there's four different landscapes, forest, water, mountain, and plains. And those same symbols appear on in your studio. And those are the spots where you place your paintbrush that actually gives you access to paint that. So I've seen people when it, it becomes the fourth 
fifth turn of the game and they they only have the ability to paint one or two types of landscapes and that really limits uh, their options in the game and and that that's probably not a huge decision point it's more something to watch out for you should not do that <laughs> yeah totally and there are definitely times though where you end up with a, a set of cards in your hand and you're like oh i really 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 want to paint this one in my in my landscape but that card might like you're saying jake uh, it might be early on in the game, the first third, and that card might be a new resource that you could add to your studio. And that tension between, oh, I really want to put this boar up here, or I really want to put this set of three trees, but I also really need the mountain that's on it. I think that tension is is one of the things that makes me enjoy the system of this game and that choice that comes from when you get these rush of cards and figuring out how to put that puzzle together. And like you're saying, sometimes you make the choice because the diplomas are sitting in front of you. Like, okay, this is my rush of points. I'm sprinting. I'm going to play this card and then I'm going to focus on resources and we'll see what other diplomas I can get in the future. I'll take one of these early ones. Um, but it definitely does leave the player room to put themselves really on their back footing. Uh, I also think I maybe now is not, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll save that thought for the end, actually. Sorry, Jake. I The drafting and the, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we can come back to it. Okay, cool. No, that sounds great. You got to keep some in the hopper. But yeah, I agree. And I think that is the interesting decision that comes in this phase of the game is when you have tension because you want to put something in both yeah. spots. But more often than not, uh, it's just boom, 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 right? You're like, yep, I can't paint these two, so I'm going to put them in my studio, and I can paint that, so I'm going to yep. paint it. Uh, and, and that's okay, too, I think, because this is also something that happens separately. Like, as soon as you take your column of cards, you place all your cards, and then the offer resumes. The other player then will take their card, their column of cards uh, and can use whatever you've done to inform their decision, which is another mm -hmm. advantage I suppose, of, of taking a later column of cards. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that's okay because that's something that you want this part of the game to happen pretty quick. Uh, and I think if, if it gets bogged down too much, if there's if it's too difficult to choose, then that might actually do a disservice to, to the enjoyment of, of play. Sure, definitely. It's it's a quick game. It's a light game. It plays in, what, 30 minutes, maybe? I mean, in two-player, we we're, we're knocking out in like, 15 minutes, 15, I think. Yeah, yeah. So not having it... I, I think the fact that the when you're placing your cards is almost always does a decision point, but not always, is kind of interesting just because it functions as sort of a built-in break sometimes. Yeah. Like you were saying, sometimes you just get dealt a hand or you end up, dra excuse me, drafting cards that you don't really have a choice. You can build this one and the other two you can't. Sometimes that feels good. Totally, yeah, you're... You I think so. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, if every single card was a painful choice, right? Sure. Because you desperately wanted it in both spots. That I think is what I'm. I, what I mean when I say that would be yeah. a disservice to the game because it would take something away from like the light, fun enjoyment that I get out of this game. Definitely. We also mentioned too the sort of tension by the end of the game of putting things in the bottom almost dissipates completely. And you're just focused on painting uh, the top side and collecting diplomas, which I like too. We've talked about how there's a turning point in this game, right? Uh, there's at some point after X amount of drafts, the game has reached the end game point and everyone's rushing for the end. And you have to know how to time that as a player. And I think that sort of meta decision, thinking through how everyone else is playing, what goals they're looking for, and sort of where you are at progressing in your goals is really rich and interesting too, because it makes every game feel a little bit different. Yeah, that, that's kind of like the heuristics, you know, the, the little bits of information that you're taking into your head when you play throughout the game. It's always important to be collecting like, what are people doing how far along are they going and how much time is left in this game? Because all of those sure. things will help you make smarter decisions in this space. So even though it's generally a quick, small thing, there's, there still can be a lot you want to take in that makes this decision feel a little bit more robust at times. Let's get into uh, something that we discussed before. So the, the next thing is <laughs> a really small decision in the game, but still one we wanted to bring up. Uh, because it can be absolutely pivotal. And that is how you place your paintbrushes on the bottom part of your tableau, or whatever you want to call it, on your studio, to 
paint paintings. Yeah, so you always start the game with two paintbrushes, and you're pretty much you're shuffling them between what's down there. Uh, you can, can you can eventually get more paintbrushes. We were sort of just talking about this, but this decision is really interesting because the amount that it's meaningful decreases dramatically as the game goes on. You get more ability to move pieces. Initially, you can only move paintbrushes once per turn, so you're fairly locked into things. You'll get the opportunity if you add them to move them more. And I think that's a really interesting decision arc And that early on it matters a ton, and then it really has a downward trend. Uh, and also, I think that because of the wild uh, pieces that you can end up putting down in the bottom, the ones that count for everything, that can also just sort of negate decisions. Once you have one that counts for everything, there's no reason to ever move your paintbrush off. Yeah, and we should say, so not only do you, you have two paintbrushes, you can place them, and then there's another symbol that comes up on the card, which is like a two-way arrow that allows mm -hmm. you to move paintbrushes off of one pot or whatever to the other. <laughs> uh, so, And you can only do that once per turn at the start of the game, but you have the potential to add more to allow you to move two paintbrushes. So that creates this dynamic where if you've already got your two paintbrushes out uh, and, and only the one arrow that from the start of the game, then you're only going to be able to move one of your paintbrushes. So even if you had access to uh, types of paint that you need to paint the paintings you've drafted, you still might not be able to paint them because you don't have enough paintbrush movements, which is just, it's just weird and kind of complicated i think i found that like new players struggle to grasp this part of the game the most which and this is kind of more going into criticism than the decision of painting these paintbrushes because or where to place the paintbrushes because frankly i don't think there's much there you know there are objectively poor things you could do like moving them off of a wild paint type but in general there's not a lot of decision there you put them where you can paint things ideally but yeah so it's it's frustrating a little bit to me and this because sometimes you get into a situation where you just can't paint things through no fault of your own and it's impossible to like plan ahead really to think yeah. like i want to leave this on the planes because i know there's more planes cards in the deck Sure. And being tripped up uh, over a really small decision, I agree that it sort of, it feels a little bit like extra added complexity. Uh, I get why it exists that you, you always want something to do with those cards. Um, and I think one interesting consequence of it is that when cards cost, there's some cards that are two of the same uh, paint type to paint. So you could have two mountains or, or two waves to paint. And the cost of them becomes not only having two of those in your resources that you can utilize, but also you lock yourself into those for the next turn, which can be restrictive. Um, but I, I agree, Jake, the, the point in which this is an interesting decision uh, it within the game and then becomes less interesting decreases dramatically. Though I do think it's interesting that the chances that you will end the game with two paintbrushes is fairly low, but the designers gave the players agency over when they would acquire more paintbrushes, right? Certain diplomas will give you an extra paintbrush, and then there's also certain cards that you can tuck uh, on that bottom half for an extra paintbrush. So letting players sort of choose if they want to add more flexibility to their resources is interesting. Uh, once you go past three, it... To me, it feels like when playing Kanagawa, there's less of a need to have four, four paintbrushes, but it's a more forgiving choice, right? So players, if they don't like that puzzle or they're feeling restricted, um, can choose to push it further if they want, or it rewards maybe expert play for playing more efficiently with fewer paintbrushes. Also, to your point too, Jake, one of the things about Kanagawa is sometimes in, in games with decks or tiles, the designers want to make it really clear to you every the odds of every single potential card coming out, uh, what this deck looks like and the shape of it. And it's important that you understand that out at the outset of the game. Kanagawa is not that type of game at all, right? Uh, I think the game almost in some ways tries to hide from you what the makeup is of the deck is. So in terms of planning with putting what these paintbrushes are, you would have to play the game a ton of times to really understand the deck super, super deeply to know what certain cards cost, how many there are of each type of card, 
Uh, so like each specific type of card, even like specific animals. Uh, and I think to the amount that I've played the game, at least that's not there. So those decisions for me just don't exist. Uh, it definitely could be, but in the sort of casual uh, way that I've played this with friends and family, it wasn't an active decision point in the game. Yeah. And to, to aid to that point, right? Like when you choose to put one of the cards in your studio, right? You flip it up and actually hide the painting that was on that. Yeah. So in that way, it's even more hidden from players, right? Uh, you know, what what has come out of the deck is would be very difficult to track for even expert level players. So I think that makes sense what you're saying about trying to kind of obscure that from players. And I think, again, that, that kind of leads into like that perhaps the designers envision this being a more casual family game where they don't really want you to min-max it to that extent where you've memorized every card in the, in the totally. game. And, you know, which I think kind of brings me back to my criticism of the paintbrush thing, the subjective experience I have when I'm doing that part of the game of deciding where to put my paintbrushes isn't, I'm going to, you know, paint this type of painting in this way or in this order because of some future implications or what anyone else is doing or what I want to do. Um, it's more just trying to find my way through the rules of grit and figure out, can I paint both of these things? Can I paint three things or not? Yeah. And, and, and in that way, it feels more like, are you smart enough to figure out this optimization puzzle, which to me isn't super fun. I think that's kind of like one of the things that just gives just, it's like a slight knock that I, I have against this sure. game. I think too, part of the reason for that so much uh, is that the top row really dominates the decision space, right? Like it's so much driving because it's how you get the diplomas uh, and how really not all the diplomas, but all of them, the paintbrushes where they're placed don't matter for the diplomas at all. Having paintbrushes matters. Um, but once they're there, it just doesn't play a, a have a place in the end game. So in terms of decision making, the paint brushes and where they're placed are really a means to an end. Like you're saying, Jake, you make the decision, okay, I want to build this tile. And then it's not, okay, how do I arrange my paint brushes to do it? It's, can I put my paint brushes? Yes. Move on. Right. It, there's no, at, there's it's for most of the game, there's no real decision once you've decided what tiles you want to place. Right. Exactly. So it just feels like restriction for restrictions sake, I guess, um, which, you know, is, is what it is. Some people might really like that uh, and, and find a, a lot of joy of like, yes, I've figured out the most efficient way to move my paintbrushes and now I can achieve these paintings. And that's great. Um, you know, but that just wasn't something that I particularly enjoyed uh, yeah. deciding in the game. But let's let's move on from that to the last of the major decisions and really all of the decisions that you'll make in this game which is award claiming. And this is, uh, I guess I should say diploma claiming. So this is what you mentioned in the rules explanation. Once you have achieved the necessary board state to take one of the objectives because you have the right amount of landscapes in your studio or you have the right amount of trees, uh, you can choose to take that diploma or you can pass uh, if you think you'll be able to achieve an even better one in the same category later on in the game. But once you've passed, you can never go back to that. Best rule in the game, bar none. The The decision from the designer is to allow you to press your luck in, in this point in the game and sort of say with your decision, I think I can do better is so interesting. Uh, and it allows so many different strategic options. I, I love this aspect of the game so, so much. Uh, and I also, I really enjoy how they're broken into sort of top of your top of your tableau and bottom of your tableau goals. Uh, I think the top tends to matter more in terms of weight than the bottom. So diploma wise, it's a little bit top heavy. Uh, but with that said, I think that there's there's a lot of interesting decisions that you can make here too because of the different things that they added to the diplomas to sort of sweeten the pot that might make you want to go for for a certain diploma uh, versus others when pressing on might be a sure bet 
otherwise given the game state. And I guess what I mean by that is there's sometimes you'll get a paintbrush associated with them or the first player marker. And sometimes you'll get these little tiles that are uh, storm clouds that represent any season in the top for your, your run of the most seasons in a row. So it really it incentivizes you. It complicates your decision. You're not just saying, do I think I can achieve this goal, but do I want the benefits that aren't just points from coming from this too? Yes. And you know, that's, again, that's funny that you say it complicates your decision making. And I guess it does, because I, I agree with what you're saying, right? It it makes an extra level to everything, like what your the cards you're taking, how you're placing them into your studio or into your painting. And but like to me, the effect it has is almost to like distill what you're accomplishing. Mm. Like this game is all about those heuristic decisions of or you know or sorry i should say the heuristics of, of thinking about what everybody else is trying to accomplish and how that impacts what you're trying to do and then sure. the diploma lets you call your shot right so you're yeah. taking in all that you're like they've got one tree she's got two trees i've got one or i've just got three uh so do i want to take that you know no i'm gonna press on because i don't think they're really going for that. That's more incidental to them and, you know, or so on and so forth. And I, and I like that it allows you to say, this is what I believe it's, you know, in that moment you're saying like, this is what I believe about the game state. Yeah, totally. And I love too, that once a, a player makes the decision to take one of these diplomas, you can sort of ignore that part of their board. If you are sort of, when we were playing the two player game, for example, once you've claimed a, uh, once you've claimed a blue diploma, I don't really have to worry about you taking animals. I'm not competing with you, except for maybe the chance that you want to hate draft something for me too. So I think that's another way in which Kanagawa ends up being sort of generous to the player. Um, I think that the decisions here generally, I don't know. Do you think, Jake, that the decisions with the diplomas end up feeling complex or just... Uh, or enrich, or are they easy but beneficial to the game state? I, I don't know where I fall on that. Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, and it's, I mean, that this is what I think is so fun about uh, this podcast. It's just like, what do those decisions feel like? And with this diplomas, what I feel like is, even though it's hard, it isn't like painful in that same way. Like I, I think, I don't think it's an easy decision, right? I think because yeah. there are a lot of factors that come into it that are unknowable to you, right? So like, you don't know what your opponents are trying to do. You know, somebody could have two trees, but it's really like incidental because they, uh, you know, they just grabbed them because it, it added to their string of seasons. Mm hmm. And they also have three houses. So, you know, they really want to get that fourth house and they're not going to prioritize that. And you also don't know what cards are going to come out of the deck, right? So, you know, it could be that you are going to wait on an animal to show up that just never comes in sure. the game. So it doesn't feel like it has that same stakes of, of right and wrong. When I'm making that choice, like the feeling is good. Like you feel powerful in the moment because... A, you've already achieved something, so that feels good, right? You're like, I've already done this, and what I'm saying is like, I'm going to do even better than that. So it just feels like fun. It's like a moment of like a show of strength almost. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't think that there's a ton of... I don't often play games where they allow the player to make a decision that could almost come off as like cocky. That's like a weird thing for a decision in like sort of a, a euro -y game to allow you to do. But Kanagawa definitely sort of lets you do that by not taking an objective when you achieve it to press for something more. Uh, and I, I love that about the game. Um, it can also really punish your hubris, right? <laughs> if someone beats you to the to the third tier diploma that you needed, it could just be devastating. You just locked yourself. You never get to go back and pick the earlier diplomas. You're going to miss like seven or more points. Oh, it feels so bad. Yeah, it also makes you a target. And I think... yeah. You know, if you pass on the second to last, right, meaning you can only get the final biggest diploma, somebody might just incidentally say like, you know what, I don't want you to have seven points for that. Yeah. So I'm going to, you know, just 
you know, they're incorporating that information into their decision making. So now they're deciding between one or two columns or like that are roughly equal to them. Like, oh, also, I'm going to take the one, break the tie with the one that screws Brendan over from get, completing his <laughs> diploma. So yeah, so it, it, it changes the whole game state, not just for you, but to everyone in an interesting way. So yeah, so I mean, I think that is like fantastic and rich and a lot of fun. I totally agree. And really quickly, I'll just say I would love to see more games that have press your luck mechanics that aren't just built on output randomness, right? This is like real, real input randomness in a way, right? It's not like you're you're making this decision and then you're rolling the dice and seeing the consequence of what happens. You're making the choice. Uh, and I guess there's probably some output randomness and the chances of like what cards come out and that sort of thing. But it's not like you get the the decision right away. And it's so much dependent on other players choices. And you have a lot of information going into that decision to press your luck too. Do you have any thoughts, uh, any other thoughts on kind of these diplomas and what it feels like in that decision space? I think that we covered it for the most part. I will say, I think they're really wonderfully designed. Uh, the way that the trees just scale from, you just want the most possible, three to three to five or more, great. The buildings, you're always going for different. That's really interesting uh, in terms of decisions and what columns you might take. I think that adds a lot of texture to the game. And then the way that the people are designed, where the first two you want different people, but the, the, the one that's the most, you want the three of the same type of person. I think that inversion is really clever and that can make your decisions uh, kind of tough early on, right? Because it, it flips the whole decision paradigm on its head. You can't, you, you kind of can't go broad. And when you're picking cards, if you're, if you know you want to go for the person for three, right? So that's, that's kind of interesting because you need three matching people. And that's a big investment to get three matching people versus three different people on your board. Yeah, honestly, good luck with that. I mean, <laughs> like that one in particular seems very hard to achieve. Like you almost would have to like fall backwards into it. Like you get a tile early or, you know, you get a column early on that has two of the same person or something. But it seems hard to like, I don't think you could have success if at the beginning of the game you're like, you know, before any cards were dealt and you say, I'm going to go for the three of the same person. Like, I don't think that would go well for you. Yeah, certainly one that's probably easier at higher player counts too, where you're seeing more cards. I think this is also the fact that all the diplomas are the same, but different is another way the designers obfuscate the game state. It just makes it a little harder to parse. Uh, you know, if yeah. everything was like, okay, if you get three of these, you get three points. If you get four, it's five. If you get five, it's seven. If that was the same with trees, people, and houses, it would make the game state feel more parsable in a way that would make you want to do the math and look at everyone's board and really spend a lot of time thinking. But because like the trees are different than the houses, than the people, than the landscapes, you know, the information overloads you in a way that's like you can't really look at it and understand everything. So you just have to make the choice of letting in the things that you think are the most important bits of information and making decisions based on that, which I think is fantastic and, and really smart because the more understandable a game this light is, I think the more it kind of would fall apart. I completely agree. And I think that one thing that we'll probably dive in or you'll dive in on the podcast in future episodes too, is just, I think it's interesting how it's always the same framework in which you're making these decisions, but because of the design of the diplomas, you're making different types of decisions within that same framework. And that gives such a rich texture to the game. And it lets your brain play with these, a functionally a very similar problem that feels completely different. And that's just brilliant. I love that about the game. That's awesome. Uh, well, let's leave it there. And I do want to say, if you, I know you had something you wanted to come back to. If there's any final thoughts. I'll leave this as a cliffhanger. Kanagawa never could have existed without Seven Wonders being designed. And it's a, a spiritual sequel that's simplified by a different designer. Food for thought. All right. Well, that is uh, something to tickle the brains of everyone. I mean, this is a delightful game. It's a lot of fun. I hope listening to this discussion of the decisions that you'll make gives you some insight into what this game is like and and maybe uh, some folks listening will be better informed about whether 
uh, those decisions sound right up their alley if they would like to enjoy existing within that decision space. Um, so I hope that you may have found this valuable in some way. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Decision Space. Brendan, it was absolutely wonderful talking with you and I would love for you to come back. Let's do it again anytime you want, man. Awesome. One of the best decisions I've ever made. I, I'm so happy. This is awesome. Thanks so much, Jake. You are now exiting the decision space. Thanks for listening. Please take care and enjoy the rest of your game. game.